<clears throat> Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and we are continuing our series, The Christmas Special. Today we look at Joseph, Mary, and Jesus' the family's flight to Egypt. But before we do that, let's prepare ourselves with a moment of prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity and the privilege to study your word. During the Christmas season, people get out of focus on what we should be focusing on. Help us stay true to your word, true to Jesus. Be with us this, this day when we study your word, that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. When we left last time, <clears throat> King Herod had sent off the Magi to Bethlehem. Let's review a little bit, beginning at Matthew chapter 2, verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. So King Herod orders the Magi to search for the child and report back after they found him. But this was a ruse by the king so that he could actually locate and have the child killed rather than worship him. The Magi, verse 9, after hearing the king, they left and behold, the star which they saw when it rose went on before them until it stopped above where the child was. Now notice that the Magi did not say they were going to do what King Herod commanded them. But King Herod would have expected them to. Verse 10 tells us the reaction to the star. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with very great joy. Now they have their divine, supernatural guidance system back. So they follow the star. Verse 11, as they came into the house and saw the child with mother, his mother Mary his mother, they bowed down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, this pretty much wraps up the end of the Magi's visit. One more verse, verse 12. After being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back another way to their own country. So after the Magi finished their worship and presentation of their gifts, they were told in a dream, revealed to them by God, to not to return to Herod. And you can imagine if they went back to Herod, that Herod would have been uh, interrogating them to find out where this baby was and God did not want his magi involved in that. So they went back home avoiding Jerusalem. God is protecting them and the child with his family. And notice that the magi did not obey the king of reporting back but rather God and went home another way, avoiding Jerusalem. Simple lesson, we always obey God over man, even if that man's a king. Verse 13 begins our lesson today about the flight of Joseph and the family to Egypt. Matthew 2.13 <clears throat> now when they had gone, that's the Magi, 
Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So after the Magi leave, an angel appears to Joseph and gives him several commands. And these are all in the command form in the original language. Take, flee, and remain. Take the child, flee to Egypt, remain there until further instructions. So Joseph was to take the family to Egypt. Now Egypt was another country, but it was also under the rule of Rome. So there would be law and order, and there would be uh, basically safe roads to travel. And in Egypt, there was a large population of Jews there. So they would fit right in as a family. Egypt was also nearby. So this was the place to go. This was the clear path, and that is where they go. The commands are clear. Go to Egypt, stay there until you are told to leave. And the reason is given. God doesn't always give us the reason why we are to leave some places. But here he does in that he says, Because Herod is going to send men to search for the child to destroy him. So the point we see here is that God moves them out of the area to protect them. And God will do that for his people. Sometimes he will move them and the reason is to protect them from what's coming. Here's a point of application. Sometimes God will move you or your family to protect you. You may not always know what it's from, but God does. Sometimes your time there or mission in a place is up, and it's time to move on. It may be a temporary move. God may have you move back to that area one day. But we have to be sensitive to the Lord's leading. And by that I mean to be sensitive to the Lord's leading Let's just look a few principles on that. To know the Lord's leading, let's just title it that way. To know the Lord's leading. First thing, know the scripture. See, that way you know the principles. You know if there's something going on bad, if something's going on, something, if something's going on that you must avoid, then you are alert to the fact that you may have to leave. The next thing is, is that you know the scripture, you follow that. You follow the principles. You follow the principles. And then thirdly, you interpret the circumstances in light of scripture. That is, you interpret the circumstances of what you know about Scripture. If you have a ruler that suddenly commands you to do things that are unbiblical, against God's law, you may be looking for a way out of that area. That's just an example. And then once you interpret the circumstances, you make a wise decision. And that involves where to go, when to leave, perhaps what to take with you, uh, is it going to be a temporary move or whatever the case? If we know God's word, that is the largest part of doing his will. Now, depending on your gifts and ministry, God may not want you tied down to an area for a long time, a lifetime, for example. People often think that they've got to find a place and stay there all their life when in fact if God has you gifted with certain spiritual gifts and ministry he may want you to move around he may want you to move a lot a lot or maybe a little again you follow 
to principles of the Lord's leading. Sometimes God has us move to serve him somewhere else. Well, Joseph obeys. Verse 14, Matthew 2, 14. So he got up, referring to Joseph, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. It appears that right after the Magi got the word to leave and left, that Joseph received this dream and he and his family left for Egypt. They didn't waste any time. Once they got the word to move from God, they left. Notice they even traveled by night. Remember that it was usually not safe to travel at night. People usually didn't travel at night because of robbers or, or wild animals out there. And you don't want to walk off the edge of the path into a ditch and that type of thing. They didn't have flashlights and it would have been difficult to carry a candle all that way. And if the moon wasn't full enough for you to, to walk, you had to be careful to, to, to see where you're going, you see. So this is all in keeping with God's command. And when you are told to leave, even if it's at night, and God told you, you could not be safer. When it's time to go, it's time to go. Now, did they take everything they had? Did they take all their household goods, all their furniture and, and blankets and table and knives, forks, and spoons? We're not told. The point is, even if they did have to leave some things behind, that wasn't going to stop them from moving. So they go to Egypt. Well, verse 15. And he stayed there until the death of Herod, so that what was fulfilled by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. Excuse me, what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. And that saying is, out of Egypt I called my son. Now, when we hear these Old Testament scriptures quoted in these verses in Matthew, some of them are quite challenging to try to find out exactly what this is referring to. And we don't always find the quote meaning what we might expect. So we have to be open until we find out what it means. Now this particular quote out of Egypt I called my son is from Isaiah 11.1 1. and it's more of what I call a near quote. It's not word for word but the basic meaning or gist is the same and here it is in Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a child I loved him and out of Egypt I called my son. Let me just ask you, look at this verse. Who is the child? Israel. Israel, the nation Israel, is called a child. And it was called out of Egypt. Remember that major event in the Old Testament, the Exodus. So the first reference when this was written or Hosea prophesied it, referred to Israel being called out of slavery from Egypt. Now, in our Matthew passage, he applies it to Jesus being called out of Egypt. So, Jesus is like Israel who will be called out of Egypt. And that will happen later in our passage. But first, he has to get there. So Jesus, with his family, is moved down to Egypt. And in what sense was the scripture fulfilled? Well, 
Jesus represents the nation Israel. So Jesus here equals the nation Israel. Israel as a nation was freed from Egypt to serve God. Remember, Israel went on and they crossed the Red Sea, 40 years in the desert of testing, right? And then they went into the promised land. What few was left in the new generation that came up, right? Well, Jesus went 40 days in the desert. And then he went on to serve God fully in ministry there in Israel. So we see these parallels in Jesus being like Israel. The people of Israel were tested in the desert, right? So was Jesus. So they were both tested in the desert. The fulfillment of this scripture comes in terms of Jesus being like Israel. Jesus being like Israel. Now in Daniel, we learned the term type and antitype, didn't we? Israel became a pattern for Jesus' life. Now another comparison we see between Israel and and Jesus is the fact that both were protected by God. God had his hand on Israel as God has his hand on Jesus and his family. Now, as we proceed through the story at this point, and we're just about to finish our Christmas special, we keep in mind that the focus becomes more on Jesus now. And by that I mean the stories of the Gospels are more about Jesus. All right? The nation becomes, and I use this word, backdrop. They become the background. In the Old Testament, the focus was on Israel. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, it is on Jesus. Now the nation is going to eventually fall further back in the background and even uh, they become uh, so taken over by Rome. They even destroy Jerusalem later on. But the point here, when Jesus was ministering to the nation of Israel, is how are they going to respond to him? But the focus, as I said, is on Jesus. And then how is Israel going to respond? Are they going to repent as a people, as a nation, and enter the kingdom of God? Well, we go down the road and we know that most of the people did not. And the nation of Israel was set aside for up to now. It's been about 2,000 years. And they will come back for one last seven year period, which we've been studying in Daniel quite a bit, called the tribulation. Well, verse 16 tells us Herod's reaction to the Magi not coming back. Matthew 2, 16. Then Herod, then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very angry and sent his soldiers to kill all the male children in Bethlehem and throughout the surrounding region from the age of two and under. According to the time he had learned from the wise man. Now the word, the word for tricked here, we'll look at that in just a moment, looks like this.
The word is empizo. It means to ridicule, to make fun of, to trick someone. E M P A I Z O. Long O. When the Magi did not return to Herod, he felt that he had been tricked by them. And this made this king look foolish. He became very angry, furious, in fact. So he sent his men, his soldiers, to kill all the male children to and under. Now, Bethlehem at the time was a small village. The text tells us that it was also the surrounding region that he had the young male children killed. So this was probably not more than a dozen or so children. That wouldn't be considered a big massacre in those days, except to those poor families who lost their children. The child, Jesus, at this point, was probably a toddler at most, somewhere between 6 to 18 months old. But Herod's going to cover not only that group, but those younger and those older, making sure that all the children, two and under, were killed. And you see, he had got his estimates of how old the child would have been from talking to the Magi when they saw the star. And then in verse 17, we have another Old Testament scripture quotation. Then what had been fulfilled through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Well, let's talk about this passage from Jeremiah for a few moments. Jeremiah was another one of those great prophets from the Old Testament who has a long book in the Old Testament. He was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah, he warned them time and time again of the discipline that would come from the Lord on the southern kingdom just as it had come on the northern kingdom back in 721 and 722 B.C. from the Assyrians. So the northern kingdom had been, had been disciplined and conquered by the Assyrians. These are dates you ought to eventually remember in 721 to 722 B.C. Okay? Now, Ramah is a city in Benjamin. Now, if you divide, let's just look at the southern kingdom, basically. You have the southern kingdom down here. And you have Jerusalem. You have Bethlehem. Okay? And Benjamin is kind of a tribe in the middle of all of this, okay? <clears throat> now, the town we're talking about is Ramah. It's about five miles north of Jerusalem. Uh, this is Jerusalem. Uh, this is Bethlehem. I shouldn't have put that so far down there because it's not but about five miles from Jerusalem the other direction. So let's straighten that out a little bit. Let's put Bethlehem down here. We'll put a B for Bethlehem. And then Ramah is about right here. Okay? Rachel is mentioned in the passage. Now Rachel was the wife of Jacob, the mother to Joseph. All right? So we'll keep in mind the place of Ramah. And then we'll go talk about Rachel. Rachel was, as I said, one of the wives of Jacob. 
All right. And she was the mother of Joseph and Benjamin, little Benji, the youngest. Now, she had had a difficult time having children. She had been barren a long time, and finally she has children. The story of that is in Genesis 30, verses 1 and 2. But Rachel was also the grandmother. She was also the grandmother of Ephraim and Manasseh. And they became two of the larger tribes of the northern kingdom. Now what did I say happened to the northern kingdom? They were destroyed, weren't they? So she had experienced, had she been alive, she would have experienced the death of a lot of her descendants. So the idea here is, that figuratively, now that means it doesn't happen in reality, but as a figure, Rachel, it's like her crying from her grave. You've heard the saying, people turn over in their grave. Well, this is like her crying from her grave for the children that she lost in the northern kingdom. This is about 135 years earlier than Jeremiah. And then it says that Rachel refused to be comforted because they are no more. Let's look at that verse one more time. Matthew 2, 18. This is a verse we're looking at. A voice heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Well, the point is that it, the weeping was so bad, and again, this is figurative, she refused to be comforted. She just wasn't going to be comforted. It was so bad. And then it says, the reason is because they are no more. Her descendants would be wiped out. Now, this is a sad situation. And Matthew is drawing from Jeremiah the same sad situation. Matthew is using that situation about Rachel and her descendants with this situation, all these Jewish children being killed in and around Bethlehem. The crying out and mourning for the loss of children to these parents would have been just horrible. And he doesn't want us to miss this. This tells us something about the ruthlessness of Herod. In verse 19, we see Joseph and Mary are going to leave Egypt and return to Nazareth of all places. But first, someone has to die. Here we go, verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Again, we see an angel appear in a dream to Joseph to tell him and his family what to do. Now, shortly after all these children had been massacred in and around Bethlehem, King Herod dies. It also mentions whoever else is seeking out the children. It may have been his father because he died not long before Herod. His name was Antipater. Anyway, the way is clear to go back to Israel. So it appears 
that he planned to go back to Bethlehem, where he had left. Now Joseph thought the way was clear to go to Bethlehem. Verse 21. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and entered into the land of Israel. So he's back entering the land. He's crossed the border, and then he gets word that Archelaus was ruling over Judea instead of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there. Now, Archelaus was one of the three sons of Herod. They received parts of the kingdom. Archelaus got the southern part down here in Judea. Okay? Now you may know something of the land at that time. You had Samaria over in here, right? Up here you had Galilee. We had the Sea of Galilee. Then down here you had Judea. We had Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Egypt's over here. So they come back up into the land of Egypt. But then they hear that Archelaus is ruling here. He had a reputation like his father. He also was ruthless and he was also cruel. But once they heard that he was in charge, they say, boy, we really can't go back there. But then what happens? Verse 22. God knew that too. Verse 22. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee. So when Herod died, Archelaus took over. Joseph thought it was clear till he heard who had took over. And he avoids that area and goes on up to Galilee. Let's look at a map right quick. This again is from Accordance. Here's the map. We start at Bethlehem down here, about the center of the map. And they will flee to Egypt, as we saw in our story. They're down there until they get the all clear. They come back up, avoid Jerusalem, and go back up to Galilee to their home city, Nazareth. So now they're back in Nazareth, which is, as you may remember, where the story started. Verse 23. And came and dwelt in a town called Nazareth, so that what was said by the prophets was fulfilled that he would be called a Nazarene. So they returned to Nazareth, a town that they're familiar with, having lived there before they were pledged. And when they were pledged, Nazareth was a small village in the region of Galilee, about 15 miles from the Sea of Galilee. Now, if you were to search the Old Testament scriptures, you won't find Jesus being called a Nazarene. So why is it said that the prophets said, by the prophets was fulfilled that he had be called a Nazarene? Because sometimes when they use these Old Testament references, they use what we call a concept or the idea. And the idea behind Nazareth that connects us with Jesus being a Nazarene is that Nazareth was a place that, well, it was a, it was a town that was ridiculed. It was a town that people would say, 
Oh, you're not from there, are you? So people make fun of you if you're from that town. You're from that little old town? You know, that's the type of thing you hear out in the, uh, when you live in the city and they make fun of people who come out from the country and the people in the country makes fun of people who come from the city. So it goes both ways. Um, believe me, I've lived both. I know how it is as a child and as, as an adult. But this is one of those towns that people made fun of. Now, Jesus would be from Nazareth. Listen to even what the di disciples said about this town, Nazareth. John 1, 45 and 46. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything... Good, come from there, Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. So you see, even Nathaniel knew that Nazareth had a poor reputation, especially for anyone good coming out of there. Well, like people made fun of Jesus, so they would make fun of Jesus and deride him in his ministry. By that I mean as they made fun of the town he was from. They would also make fun of him. Just listen to one passage or others, but I'll use this one. Listen to what Jesus says people are saying about him. Now, he's the son of man, okay? That's one of his titles. Jesus is speaking. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. And the point here is that people made fun of Jesus, even if he did the normal things. They made fun of John the Baptist if he did the not normal things, you know, living out in the desert and eating bugs and wearing that, that hairy coat. Jesus didn't do that. But they still made fun of him, even though he did the normal things. They said he ate too much and he was a drinker. Well, so we see the connection here is between the reputation that Nazareth had for being a town that people made fun of and Jesus, who was often ridiculed also. So the prediction is that Jesus will come from a place that people make fun of, just like they do to him. Well, this ends our Christmas special, in the book of Matthew, that is. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenges you've set before us as we see divine guidance with the family of Joseph, your protection of Jesus time and time again, protection of the Magi. Help us learn to know the scripture so that we too might be sensitive to your leading and to do your will. Thank you for the Christmas story. Thank you for the blessings we've derived from the scripture itself to learn so much about our Lord Jesus our Savior, uh, your Christ, our consolation, our redemption. Challenge us with the lessons we've learned that we might always understanding, understand the true meaning of Christmas. Perhaps go over these verses again in the future to remind us of the greatness of our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen.